excited tonight to have Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark of the 9th Congressional District as our special guest tonight. Yes, and this special guest hails all the way from Central Brooklyn and a proud daughter of Jamaican immigrants. She represents the 9th Congressional District of New York and dedicated herself to continuing the legacy of excellence established by the late Honorable Shirley Chisholm. She succeeded her pioneering mother, former city council member, Dr. Una S.T. Clark, making them the first mother-daughter secession in the city council's history. Welcome, Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark. Uh, Hello. Thank you for having me, ladies. It's great to be with you. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for coming on. It's been a long time since I've had an opportunity to speak to you. You know, you've been a very, very busy uh, woman. So welcome, and thank you for taking the time to come on. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Okay. So we have a lot of hot stuff, hot topics to talk to you about tonight. So we just want to start off with, uh, since today is the anniversary of, of George Floyd. Uh, so we wanted to ask you about the the bill that's in the um, House of Representatives now that's trying to get past the uh, the George Floyd, um, uh, what is it called? George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Now, it's been in the House, it was passed, but it can't seem to get passed in the Senate. What what seems to be the problem here that we can't get this bill passed? Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, but uh, right now, uh, there are House members meeting with the Senate members, in particular, Senator uh, Scott of South Carolina, who's a Republican, is the lead. Senator Cory Booker, excuse me, is the lead Republican. Senator Cory Booker is the lead Democrat um, on the Senate side. And of course, Karen Bass is negotiating on behalf of the House, where we have passed the bill already. And it's my understanding that the negotiations are long, they're arduous, but they're moving in the right direction. And that's what we want to see. We want to make sure that every provision that we have passed in the House bill makes it into the Senate legislation because we feel that every element of the George Floyd Policing Act, uh, George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is passed uh, and because each and every provision is, is so needed. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, throughout our history in this country, uh, the murder of black people, at the hands of those who were charged to protect and serve, uh, unjustifiably um, dismissed in, in too many cases. And that has uh, been a source of terror in black communities for far too long now. And we really just cannot live under the threat that every time we encounter a police officer, it may be the wrong person, mm -hmm. the person who has um, you know, uh, malice uh, in their heart uh, or racism as a part of their being and that that encounter could be our last. Absolutely. I agree. So now what, is, is, is what is in the bill that they are having such a problem with? Is it because they want um, it put in there about what to do with the police officers when they, you know, you might as well say commit a crime or whatever. Like what is in there that's, that that's holding it up that they're arguing about that they just can't agree on? Because I know there's certain things 
they don't want to put in there against against the officers. Well, what it is is a provision that has been, um, you know, throughout federal law um, that provides something called qualified immunity to police officers, and it's essentially a uh, get out of jail free card, if you will, for officers when they commit this crime. In other words, the officer is given far more the benefit of the doubt. Uh, there are shield; they are shielded from any civil litigation, um, any litigation whatsoever. Uh, and if you notice that um, wherever there's a case of police brutality, a case of police misconduct, or the ultimate taking of a life, the family's recourse ends up being suing the police department or the city in which mm -hmm. the atrocity took place. Right. Um, and what we recognize is that as long as police officers have this shield, um, they will not um, comply with the demands of being held accountable. And so mm -hmm. that qualified immunity clause is the area that seems to be uh, the, the highest hurdle for us to get over uh, in terms of negotiation. But we have some great negotiators at the table and I'm, <clears throat> I'm cautiously optimistic that we can get past that um, and make sure that we hold, I mean, the bill is called uh, you know, Justice in Policing Act. Yes. And yes. there is no justice if an officer can walk away from taking someone's life, uh, be rehired, put back on the job, mm -hmm. or are able to then move on to another police department exactly. without exactly. having to uh, have to having to reveal in any way, shape, or form that they have actually taken a life um, under under circumstances that were unjustifiable. Okay. So since his death, we have seen numerous cosmetic changes at the local level. So how do you feel about the changes they have made thus far? And do you believe that there will be a time that we can all live together in peace? Well, you know, that that's what the aim is. And it, it's up to every generation to take up the baton of those who came before us, who have fought this fight, who have led this battle and 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 claim the victory. But we can only claim the victory if we stay um, focused, um, if we're unwavering in our commitment to our collective humanity, uh, because this is all about um, Black people being treated with the same humanity as any one of these officers would want to be treated and any other community would want to be treated. And so uh, I am cautiously optimistic that we will get to that point uh, where we can proclaim victory where uh, we will begin a practice of policing in the United States that is about public safety and not um, about uh, the tragic occurrences that happen when you have officers that are embedded in departments across this nation that harbor ill will uh, and harbor murderous thoughts of black people um, mm -hmm. and are, are fearful, quite frankly, uh, of the job that they have been sworn to do. And so I think that those are some of the elements that go into the overreaction that comes when encountering Black people driving, walking, talking, sleeping in the park, wherever we may be, um, and then uh, unfortunately uh, have these types of interactions with police, the police departments around this nation. But, mm -hmm. but you know, Congress, Con Congress money that, you know, I was thinking the other day, uh, the day the young lady, remember the young lady that, ran over the officer on the freeway uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they said that she was driving uh, drunk. She's, you know, been smoking weed and all this kind of stuff. So she killed one of the officers, right? But but when they arrested her and they was talking about her, and they was talking about her like really like just awful. And I was sitting there looking and I was saying, no one should, should die either way. No officer or, or, or no individual person. So it's like a double standard. When we it's are always, shot down or anyone else is shot down, it's not, they don't take it away like, oh, that was horrible. Why could, how could you do something like that? But then when it's reversed around and one of the officers, someone get killed, like the lady, like I said, she probably didn't mean to run over, but she really shouldn't have been driving under influence, but she was. Why is there a double standard 
that now she's the most horrible person in the world because she killed an officer. Like I said, nobody should be. You know why, Lottie? Because there's a video surfacing uh, with her saying all kind of derogatory means and stuff towards police. So this is probably something that added to her conviction or her being arrested. Now she's on the other side. So that video has been surfacing all over the place. No, I saw the video. I yeah. saw the video of her said talking about, you know, the police officers and stuff like that. But what I'm saying is it's not even even with her case. It's other cases that someone has uh, killed the officer or whatever. But it's like they the worst person ever because the president of the police officer association, every time something happened like that, he always comes out and say all these vicious things. But then when the officer does something, he never comes out and say, yes, we do have bad apples in the bunch and we do have good officers. So we need to weed out the bad ones. He always takes up for the bad ones, always. Well, Shannon, you know, I, I, I would tell you and Dr. Vanessa, you're, you're absolutely right that the double standard is something we have lived with for generations. I mean, think about the fact that you know, in our households, we have the talk, right? Um, we we uh, go through extreme lengths to protect ourselves uh, and our children and our families uh, because we know that it all it can take is, you know, a, a facial expression, um, you know, a, a change in the tone of our voice that can trigger an officer that will end in the taking of someone's life. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we're not saying that all black people are angels, far be it from that, but we have a justice system. And the idea is not for our officers to be the judge, jury, and executioner. The job is for them to uh, safely arrest the individual and lead them to justice, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, notwithstanding uh, whether the young woman harbored ill feelings towards police officers or not, she deserves uh, the dignity of her humanity. Exactly. And she deserves exactly. to uh, to face the music, you know, exactly. to before um, a jury of her peers to determine whether in fact her behaving or her behavior or her utterings um, were uh, a factor in but what ultimately ended up taking the life of the officer. That's for a judge and jury to determine, not for us in the court of public opinion. Well, see, that's what I always said, because it's always they want to make their own rules and, and, and say who should be convicted and who should, should who should not be convicted. But uh, to move on, I just want to say that we do hope that this bill get passed. You know, I'm hoping that, you know, I know... Senator Cory Booker, I know he's gonna. I know he's in there talking what he needs to be talking, and 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 Miss Bass is in there talking what she needs to be talking. So I'm I'm like you. I'm pretty sure it's gonna get passed. I just hope they don't have to take out a whole lot of stuff that needs to be in there just to get it passed. So hopefully, you know, by next anniversary or before the end of this year, uh, the bill will be passed. But I also wanted to also talk to you about the immigration, um, the immigration policy we have. Like, you know, when we were, I think it's kind of slowed down a little bit now, but before when all the p children and the families was crossing over at the border, and I mean, they was just coming in by droves every day. I wanted to know, like, how does this work with the immigration? Because if we have like 5,000 and some people crossing the border every day, how is the United States going to take care of all of these people when we can barely take care of the people that we have here? And I'm not saying that we shouldn't take care or, or help the people when they come, but is their money just set aside for immigration, for stuff like this? Because then where are they getting all of this money to take care of all of these people coming in like that? When we, you know, like I said, when, you know, especially now with the pandemic hit, we got people out of work. They don't have jobs. They don't have food to feed the, the family. So how does that work when they come across the border like that? So there's a whole process that's in place to adjudicate uh, each and every individual circumstances. 
in some circumstances, people are fleeing their homes because of extreme violence, poverty, famine, you, you name it, the worst of what can happen in the human condition or what people are facing. And I'm sorry, the, I'm sorry, Congresswoman, can you hold that thought? Lottie gave you a lot to marinate with, but well, we got to take oh. a break, a short break, <laughs> and we'll be right back. I'm sorry. <laughs> you see how I did? I forget about the break. <laughs> it's Shannon. you rise this is where you shine this is where you become the greatest of all time history in the making this is history in the making history in the making vote for your life it's We are back. You see, I got so excited about my guest today, Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark, that I, I, I forgot to go to break. But we're back and we was talking to her about the immigration uh, process. Absolutely. Well, uh, Shannon, I was, what as I was saying is that the circumstances by which we see immigrants coming over the southern border of the United States is a combination of circumstances that individuals find themselves in, in their homes of origin. And what we do is we adjudicate each and every single case. And where the courts find that it's justified that someone is actually seeking asylum, that they don't present a threat to the United States of America, um, you know, we provide for that through our laws. Uh, your concern about how these individuals uh, will be tended to. Um, at the end of the day, these individuals are essentially on their own. They are prohibited from receiving federal funding and federal benefits as uh, immigrants to this country. Once they're granted asylum, they're then granted work authorization. And they, like every other person in this United States, uh, have the right to go out and look for work. Many of them end up becoming entrepreneurs. Uh, many will end up, uh, of course, paying their share of taxes because, of, again, again they're, they're purchasing things, they're adding to the economy. And so it's really a circumstance where uh, we as a nation can actually absorb uh, mm -hmm. immigrants coming to the United States. That's been unfortunately or fortunately, the history of how this nation has come into being, how it's been populated by different populations. The only exception being, of course, the indigenous who were uh, basically wiped out by you know, the, the initial individuals that came to the United States and decided that they were gonna you know, take the land of the Native American. Yeah. And of course, the the African that was kidnapped, brutalized, and brought here to be chattel slaves. Um, these are the two groups in this nation that you know have never truly been given full uh, human status. Um, but it, since those days, there have been waves and waves and waves, and continue to be waves of immigrants coming from around the world that have added to um, the work ethic, the expansion, the development of our nation from vaccines to corporations, many of them are headed by immigrants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when oh. our people say they can't get a job because other people have taken their jobs, so we'll just say, what what is that? They just don't want a job uh, I mean, I know that's true, too, that they don't want a job. I can't speak to what motivates certain individuals to say these things. What I can say right now in Washington, D.C., there's a debate raging about taking back uh, unemployment benefits because 
uh, there are employers out there saying that they have jobs, but they don't have the people to fill them. And they believe that people are uh, intentionally staying on unemployment much longer because their wages that they receive from their unemployment benefits uh, surpass what they would receive working in certain industries. And that may or may not be the case. What I would say is that we know that a lot of women are having a hard time getting reintegrated back into the workforce because childcare uh, is what they need uh, in order to be able to feel that their children are safe, secure, being educated, being well treated as they re-enter the workforce. So there are a whole host of reasons that people will point to uh, for why uh, they're not getting jobs. I think that we're moving into a post COVID-19 economy and there's a demand for the, the, the living wage to be moved to the forefront, that the minimum wage be federally raised to $15 an hour, which to me is a day late and $15 short an hour. But, uh, you know, we've got to get it right for our people. We've got to get it right for our economy. We've got to get it right uh, for this nation to move forward and to be competitive in a 21st century worldwide economy. And well, you, I think you immigrants right add to that. that. Yeah. Immigrants well, add to that. Yes, I want to add something about the immigrants. Many years ago, they had the amnesty program. I'm not sure if that's somewhere in the agenda. That's something that can be revisited. And I also want to add, when we talked about the unemployment, what about the moratorium is about to end. So what happens now when all these individuals collect their excess money, banking it, shopping or whatever they're doing with it, what happens now when it hits landlord tenant court? Is the city going to buckle down and re-establish these tenants in the same predicament that they were in? Well, I can't speak to what the city of New York is going to do. We're going through a transition in government here, and it'll be interesting to hear <clears throat> how our mayoral candidates uh, have a vision for what will happen and how the city will address what could be a catastrophic yes. um, um, circumstance with respect to evictions and, and mortgage foreclosures. But what I can say is that the federal level in the American Rescue Plan, we have made provision to actually assist, particularly those who are renting, um, uh, to meet that obligation uh, through funding that is going to be made available to renters and landlords. Because we understand that many of our landlords are, are smaller landlords, are not the heads of major developments, but, right. you know, I own little one and two family homes, uh, excuse me, two and three family homes where uh, they're renting and that helps to pay their mortgages. So we've taken that into consideration. Right now, federal agencies are working on the protocols that need to be in place to make sure that there's no abuse of that system. But I think that, you know, we have come up with every single provision that we know is necessary to navigate our people, centering the most vulnerable black and brown communities who've been hardest hit by COVID-19 to be able to, um, you know, get their bearings, get their legs under them and move forward out of this pandemic. So I'm excited about the fact that we have thought about every single uh, uh, provision that needs to be in place to assist and help our people come out of this stronger than ever before. Now, what individuals decide to do with the resources that we have made available to them, that's an individual decision. We can't police everyone. And I think that hopefully, like my grandmother, their grandmother gave them a, at least an ounce of common sense about how to be able to navigate their lives, uh, set priorities for their finances so that they can navigate their families through. New York City is a very expensive city to live in. Yes. And we know that um, what we have put forth is just a stopgap measure. So we've got to put our shoulders to the wheel, do as much as we can to economize, as my father would say, be frugal until we can see our way clear to a, a moment where we can uh, 
indulge in some of those spaces that, uh, you know, some would consider to be luxuries and not necessities. Well, you know, I, it, some, you know, it really makes me feel sad sometimes in bed because, you know, some people always have to mess up for everybody else when the system does something. It's just like you were saying earlier about the extended benefits from the unemployment rather than you taking employment and using it for what you need to use it for and help pay some of your bills. You didn't do that. And so now when it was time that your boss said, okay, you can come on back to work. You don't want to go back to work because now you figure, okay, well, I'm going to run this out as long as I can run it with the extension of the benefit, not thinking, well, what's going to happen when it run out? And now you're going to be complaining now I don't have any any money coming in because now the boss has then hired someone else. That we when something comes out from the government, it's like it's always somebody that's going to mess it up. Because I can just tell you, I know five cases of my own of people that's not going back to work because they say that I'm getting these benefits and I'm getting more money than I was when I was working on the job. So I'm not going back right now. And so well, hopefully. Say, Mm-hmm. Hopefully, they'll, they'll, they'll be looking at the job market and looking at where they can re-enter that's better than where they left. Because mm-hmm. oftentimes, we, we unfortunately, out of no fault of our own, are forced into sort of the no-growth uh, job market. Mm-hmm. And, and that has kept us in a perpetual state of uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul or poverty. Let's just call it what it is. Um, however, we have the talent, the skill, and the ability of any other group of people right. to do better. And that has to be our mantra. That has to be the way that we see ourselves advancing, not only ourselves, but our children and our families. So my hope is that in the midst of all of this, while we're online having to interact virtually, that will some folk will take the time to do a job search because there are a lot of different employment opportunities out there. And we're trying to bring forth even more new, innovative uh, pathways for people to access uh, new jobs in a new economy. And that's what the American Jobs Plan is all about. But don't wait for that because most likely there won't be a whole lot of continuity between when the benefits end and when these jobs come online. There are many jobs still uh, needing uh, qualified workers, needing you know people who are motivated to, to get up and do their part. And, and I think that it's incumbent upon us to encourage our folk to get out there and do that. And if not, I say this, we have always been an entrepreneurial people. Exactly. That's exactly what I was getting ready to say. Start a business and you become yes. an employee. Yes, because I noticed during the pandemic, we 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 added on a lot of entrepreneurs because people started doing things to bring in that extra money. They was making masks. I mean, they was they was doing they was baking. They were cooking. You know, and so now you can start your home-based business just by starting off with little things like that. And, and you know, once it catches on, then people start ordering from you, you know, and we're going to be wearing the mask for a while. So you was making them, I mean, I saw a, even to the young people were starting their own home-based business and, and stuff. And I thought that was really great. And you know what? The American Rescue Plan made provision for entrepreneurs, made provision for small business owners. So there are many different avenues to generate income if we are being creative, innovative, and we have a a, a drive and we're motivated to get up and do something. You know, this is not about, um, you know, just uh, trying to cruise through life because life catches up with you. Take it from me. We need to get out there while we're most productive, while our brains are still firing on all cylinders and do everything we can to advance ourselves and our families. Well, it, it, Dr. Vanessa is always telling us about how to do our, build our family legacy and become wealthy. <laughs> yes, it's true. But I, I, I would love to even even initiate a program where we can bring finance, finance into the community to build that generational wealth. I know Congresswoman um, um, Yvette D. Clark can come on another time or we can 
you know, add on to it to the after show. Um, body, you gotta let you gotta take us home. <laughs> because <laughs> Again. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yes. Well, we're hoping that uh, Congressman can just stay around about 10 more minutes of our after show that, for us to ask the last uh, uh, question that we wanted to ask. Is that okay with you? Can, can you hang a minute it's been, or two? It's been so long, <laughs> I will be here for the after. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Okay, we want, well, she's going to hang around with us for a while, but we want to thank the audience that was watching today, and, and we hope you enjoyed uh, Congressman uh, Yvette Clark for coming on. We hadn't seen her in such a long, long time, so we were just so excited that, that she was able to come on. So we want to thank you for watching the show today, and we hope you got something out of it. And as always, we'll see you next time. Today's show is sponsored by Abu's Bakery. If you have a sweet tooth, stop by Abu's Bakery for some delicious cakes and pies. It's Welcome to our after show, and we are still excited to have our Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark uh, still joining us. Um, we was talking earlier about a whole lot of different other things, but I, this segment, I wanted to ask you about the COVID. Like um, the governor and the mayor, you know, uh, they are saying that we can open up business as usual. You know, we don't have to wear our masks at certain places and events and stuff like that. Me, I'm not ready to take my mask off yet because I don't feel comfortable taking it off just yet. And I still don't feel like that we're just ready to open up fully just like if nothing had never happened. You know, I think there's still concerns because there's a lot of people that still have not been uh, vaccinated and, they, and they're not going to take the vaccine. They already said that they're not taking it. So I just feel like we are not, that's just my personal opinion that we're not ready to just open up everything and have all these events for a thousand and some people, whatever. What is your take on this? Yeah, Shannon, I, I think I, I fall down on, along the lines of, of, of the, the trepidation that you have about it. Uh, I serve on the Committee of Jurisdiction, the Energy and Commerce Committee that really uh, has been monitoring and putting forth all of the policies and uh, the, you know, the impetus uh, to get us through COVID-19. I mean, you have the jurisdiction of healthcare, of vaccines, of, of all of the protocols that have been put in place. We oversee the CDC, the NIH, um, and all of our healthcare agencies. And I really want to caution, particularly uh, those of us in the Black community about uh, jumping in with both feet. I think mm -hmm. that uh, we've all established sort of a new uh, hygienic uh, um, way of life. And, mm -hmm. and what, I, what I say by that is we were very cautious about uh, washing our hands, using hand sanitizer, uh, wearing masks when we're in mixed company, that sort of thing, uh, staying six feet from one another. And while we are, uh, the data does indicate that we are, um, you know, moving in the right direction. I like to remind people that as far as we know, this pandemic began with one person in Wuhan, China and spread around the world. Uh, New York City was an outbreak epicenter and mm -hmm. had one of the most crushing blows in terms mm -hmm. of more mortality rates, uh, infection rates and what have you. It all it takes is for us to let our guard down to uh, shed 
those habitual practices that we trained ourselves in washing our hands, making sure that we give people their space, their personal space, that sort of thing. Um, and I really want to encourage our folks to get vaccinated. You know, at the end of the day, as I tell people, you damned if you do, and you damned if you don't. And so I'd rather be damned if I do, because at the end of the day, COVID-19 is a very wicked virus. We oh, yeah. know that it it lives in people that look just as healthy until mm -hmm. they until the moment they're not. And so exactly. we have got to, I believe, err on the side of caution, mm -hmm. uh, be as disciplined as we possibly can in the spaces we enter into, particularly with mixed company. Um, and I will, I believe that uh, Anthony Fauci will declare for us the all clear. It, it, you know, they, they know it's not an all clear yet. Uh, they know that the numbers have dropped, but again, I'm concerned about a resurgence uh, that will, they may come in the fall. And so we need to do everything we can in preparation over the summer uh, to make sure that we are as fully vaccinated as we can. We can create as much herd immunity amongst each other as mm -hmm. a community as we can. Um, because again, it's a free country. Uh, we all have free will. There are going to be people who won't get vaccinated, but we who do will end up protecting them mm -hmm. if enough of us get vaccinated. So what is your take on a booster shot that they're talking about now? I think it's, I think it's highly likely. Um, I'm just being real, keeping it real with Shannon. Uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, we've got a lot of different strains of COVID-19 yes. now. Uh, th th there's something called a double strand. I mean, this thing has really spiraled out of control because of our negligence um, in meeting the challenge in the initial days of the pandemic. Uh, you know, we went through basically one year of, you know, wringing our hands and twiddling our thumbs. Uh, luckily, within that one year, uh, you know, science prevailed and uh, vaccines were created. Uh, however, this is a virus, like I said, very wicked, that is mutating. And it's mutating because it's finding spaces where there are people who aren't vaccinated, spaces around the world. And, you know, we, we are an international city. So we will be exposed to all different manners of strands and, uh, and mutations of the COVID-19 virus. We will most likely have to get a booster. But you know what, Evan? What you what you said is absolutely true. But the thing about it was, I'm just I'm just telling you what I was doing, right? Okay, I took the vaccine because you know I have underlying conditions, so my doctor convinced me that that I should take it. Because I wasn't going to take it, right? I said, well, okay, then I'll take it. So I I went and and I took it, right? So then it was like about maybe a couple of months afterwards, I'm watching the television, and the doctor comes on and say, oh. Well, the vaccine is only, you know, guaranteed for about uh, six months to a year, and you knew you probably going to need a booster shot. So then my thing was, well, what do I need to take the vaccine for? Now you're going to turn around and tell me I need a booster shot, and it's only going to last a year. And I'm saying in my head, I'm saying, well, if you told me that before, I don't think I would have take the, taken the vaccine. Aww. Because I'm like, why am I taking something that's only going to last a year? <laughs> Shannon, we, but that, we have to bear in mind, this is not the only vaccine that requires a booster shot. There are many different infectious diseases that we've had to treat with booster shots um, over time. And so um, people forget their initial vaccinations as a child. Um, many of those require booster shots. So, the, you know, we're working with the science, we're dealing with human body chemistry, we're dealing with so many dynamics that are out of our control. What we can control is the monitoring of the virus, how it's mutating, how it's in being impacted by the vaccine. And if in fact a booster shot is required, I will encourage everyone to take that booster shot because unfortunately we had unfettered spread and infection 
uh, by COVID-19. We've got folks amongst us who survived COVID-19, but are mm -hmm. still living with the after effects, if you will, what they call long haul syndrome uh, COVID. Um, and, and they're unable to catch their breath. Some people have never had their taste and smell return. Some people's muscles are, are not up to par. They're in physical therapy, learning to reuse uh, their muscles. This is a wicked virus. And it looks for vulnerabilities in all of us to exploit and to take our lives. I say, you know, we have enough brain power given to us to navigate ourselves in our survival through this pandemic, let us be obedient to those who are working on the front lines and not put uh, each other's lives in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you know, I never get, like I said, it's been a while since we've had a chance to, to speak. And even though we always be talking about serious stuff all the time, because I'm telling you, the pandemic has really done a number, I think, on all of us, you on know. All of but, us. But yes. yeah, so. So the thing about it is, I always like to know about the individual person. I want to know who is Event D. Clark. What makes you tick, and what do you do for fun? <laughs> okay, so Yvette D. Clark is essentially a sister from Flatbush, and what uh, drives my passion is the village that raised the child. Mm -hmm. I grew up in. Central Brooklyn, I've lived here all my life. As a matter of fact, I'm actually um, interacting with you from the home that my parents bought when I was born and they're my landlords. And so I'm on the same block in the same neighborhood that I've lived all my life. And this neighborhood was magical. The neighbors looked out for us. They reinforced the values that my parents has set forth for me and they encouraged me uh, and I've always wanted to do right by the people. I wanted mm -hmm. to give back in service to those who gave me so much. So that's what drives me. That's my passion. What do mm -hmm. I love to do? I love to dance. I love to, that's one of my favorite, that's one of my favorite pastimes. I will get down in a minute. I drop it like it's hot. Uh, we want to be invited to the next Congresswoman's party. Make sure we on the yes, list for the next absolutely, party. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I love to, I love people. I love to interact with folks. Uh, I'm blessed that both my parents still are living and a part of my life. And so interacting with family is a huge part of um, what brings me joy. Um, uh, reading, traveling, uh, you know, living life. And one thing this pandemic has taught me is that tomorrow isn't promised to anybody. Oh, and, and if you are blessed to get another day, make it the most productive productive yes. day that you can possibly make it Absolutely. because there are many who had a lot of plans and designs for their lives, mm -hmm. but the Lord had a different plan. And so let, you, let us be I, clear. Let, let me say this to you because I might not have never said it public to you. Let me say your mother, mm. Una Clark, Ma Una Clark, you don't know of Vanessa. I, I, we worked together when I was in District 17 because mm. I was at the Board of Education. And her mother doesn't play. <laughs> That's a woman that does not play. When she says something or wants something done, you better be moving. You know what I'm saying? So she was like a role model to, to us young women that was in the district at the time. And then, you know, when she decided that she wanted to retire, then you was already ready to step in. And I, I thought that was just so, just, you know, it, it really changed us as women to see the daughter step in with the, after the mother to carry on the torch what? for the neighborhood and stuff. Because the way she raised you, trained you, you know, got you ready and everything, this is what we supposed to be doing Training mm -hmm. our children, as Vanessa say, to carry on our legacy. Mm -hmm. And I'm so proud of you for stepping in 
and doing the good job that you have been doing in in the community over there. You know, I, it, it I means see. a lot to it means a lot to us to have a role model. Yes, that looks like us. Well, thank you so much, Shannon. I, and you started talking about my mom, and I was going to ask you: Imagine being raised by that woman. She's a <laughs> she's a she's a whirlwind. She was a whirlwind, and you know, uh, continues to be a whirlwind. A uh, very active, very engaged. She's on Facebook. She's on Zoom. She's still exactly. still giving. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> Shannon. Um, but again, she cultivated relationships mm -hmm. that help uh, uh, not just me, but all the children in the neighborhood to navigate mm -hmm. and understand the value in the sacrifices their parents were making for them. Mm -hmm. And even if they couldn't recognize that, they were in such a wholesome environment that mm -hmm. failure was not mm -hmm. an option. Absolutely mm -hmm. not an option. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I pay homage to that. And mm -hmm. my job every day is to create, recreate some of that 21st century style. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, we're mm -hmm. in a new time. I'm not one who uh, is that nostalgic because I recognize that we got to keep up with the times, but mm -hmm. we need to give our kids more opportunity and we need to give them more exposure to all of the work that goes mm -hmm. into battling for their human dignity exactly. and for their right to advance. Exactly. We, well, that's we, where that financial piece coming at. That's a part of it. Absolutely. <laughs> well, now tell us that's what that piece is. That we can hire no, our own kids to no, work listen, for us. This is a whole other conversation. It's a whole other conversation. I would love to partner in on some initiative bringing financial finance to the community, bridging those gaps, building that generational wealth so we can leave those legacies. And it's not just about the legacy, but creating those dynasties within our black and brown communities. Absolutely, Doc. Let me say this. Financial literacy is so critical. I, I grew up going to school in District 17 and, I, I, and I'm going to date myself because, of course, I was coming of age in the late 60s early 70s. But when I was in PS 138, all of the students had a bank account. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. And whatever oh, yes. little bit of, 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 of allowance we were getting, if it was a dime, if it was a quarter, it would go into that account. And I was mm -hmm. telling some folks just recently, I was able to get a check from the state from unclaimed funds. And that was that account that I started <laughs> when I was in elementary school. Wow. And so we, you know, it, 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 it has happened before when we take an interest mm -hmm. in our children and our families and when we don't get isolated from one another, you know, neighbors these days don't even say good morning when they pass one another. There was a time okay. when my neighbor would ask me, how did I do on the exam in school? You know, <laughs> there's a big difference between the interaction of those parents and the other side to it was, our parents, for whatever reason, um, did not discuss finance with their children. Exactly. So all of that investment they made to sacrifice to buy homes and things of that nature, they, while they passed those homes on to their children, they didn't say to their children, you're going to have to have an account set aside for this water mm -hmm. bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we paid off the house but you got to make sure you pay the taxes on the house and you do all of these things so that you can pass this house on to your children. Mm -hmm. And we just saw so many of those investments go uh, for next to nothing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. they the children sold the houses, the children sold the parents' house and everything. And they didn't so, know they didn't like, realize the value. And then didn't pay the taxes and water bills. On. Exactly. But the, but the crazy thing is that, you know, Rockefeller took finance out of the school because his yeah. theory was, you know, he's not teaching thinkers, he's teaching workers. So mm -hmm. it's now my, my goal for me to take the torch and, and to spearhead bringing finance, financial literacy into the our black and brown communities to build this generation wealth because the wealth gap is so huge. And it's that they don't have a clue because people think they just live in check to check. They have a roof over their head. They're buying food. They're living. They're surviving. This is what life is. And it's not. We don't have a clue. So I've created this legacy for my kids to build that generation wealth. And, and that's my that's my 
my pillar in the community is to give back to help other black and brown communities. See, the thing about it That's is- That's your passion. That's your passion. Well, yeah. you need to stay tuned yeah. to the debates that we're having in Washington, DC, because I mm -hmm. understand, we all understand fundamentally what's going yeah. on in our individual households. What we're not seeing is the bigger picture that has rigged the system against yes. uh, black and brown communities. The mm -hmm. tax codes mm -hmm. that have yes. favored um, some in our civil society versus right. others. Right. And when we uh, give so much more of our income to the tax base mm -hmm. than wealthiest trillion multi-million dollar corporations do uh you know we're essentially paying for our own impoverishment and so oh, we are talking in washington dc about um you know disconnecting this rigging of the system and creating equity and fairness in the american financial system so that everyone pays their fair share and Absolutely. that we create opportunities for mm -hmm. families, particularly families of, of color, to amass wealth. They rigged the system so that the wealth could be sucked out of our hands the moment it hits our bank account Absolutely. or the moment mm -hmm. we go to a check cash in place. Yes. But you All know of that, that system, was designed to suck yes. the, the wealth out of our community. But you know that same system is working how it's been designed to work because you can't have exactly. rich people without poor people. And it's all about income shifting and legacy building and insurance. And this is how these kids that are not in these black and brown communities are living off these trust funds that's on the backs of other people. So you're absolutely it's, it's, right. it's, it's always been about, unfortunately, worker exploitation. And we, yes. you know, I, I, I alluded to this very early on in our, in the first segment of the program before the after show mm -hmm. that, you know, when you build a country off mm -hmm. of, free labor. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, and you build your wealth off mm -hmm. of free labor. You're constantly in search of how right. you can continue to exploit wage labor to could keep that wealth gap expanding and expanding, expanding. And, that, and that's what we're, we're uh, unfortunately experiencing today. It's still remains that way. And, um, you know, it, 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 it shifts, of course, as we raise the minimum wage, the cost of living goes up. Yeah. And that cost of living baked into that uh, is the wealth of shareholders, the wealth of CEOs, mm -hmm. all of that is within the cost of everything that we purchase or we need to survive. Well, I don't even know when it came up with $15 is, is a, a, a big amount for for someone to be making an hour. I mean, where did that number come from? Well, that Ooh. came that num that number actually came about about 30 years ago and it's taken us this long <laughs> to get to the point where we can even discuss $15 an hour and now it's obsolete because the cost of living has, ex has skyrocketed this, so much that $15 an hour still keeps you uh impoverished. That's why I say yeah. I don't know how sometimes people do it, but because because I say how do people manage like that? But I guess they know they have good management skills of how to manage what they what money they do have. They know how to manage it because you know when you stop and you think about it, you like why are they arguing over this fifteen dollars like they doing something for the people? Well, you know if you can at least set a floor. Right now, people are making seven and eight dollars an hour. You know you yeah. can't live off of that. And, and there are colleagues in Washington, D.C. that, uh, you know, that, that stick their head in the sand um, and marginalize the fact that many of who are making those wages are not children. They're saying, well, those wages are for uh, teenagers that are working in fast food. No, those wages are being paid to people in all manner of uh, jobs and positions from those who do janitorial services to those who are taking care of our elders and home care. Mm -hmm. There are many different industries that continue to exploit the labor mm -hmm. of our people. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we they make excuses in Washington, D.C., particularly on the other side of the aisle. I happen to be a Democrat. Um, and they do this in perpetuation of 
worker exploitation. And so, you know, that's why we've got to stay on these front lines. We got to fight for that $15 an hour because that sets the floor from which we can continue to build um, for a living wage, which is going to take us closer to almost $25 an hour in, in 2021 rates. Since you, I'm gonna let you go, Yvette. But since you said that about I'm a Democrat, it made me think. Like, I just want to ask you this question here: Like, what is it? What is it with the Democrats and the Republicans? Republicans cannot sit down at the table and work together to get the agenda done to help the country. What it is? It is always like everybody <laughs> just so against each other. Is this? Is this for show or is this really happening? Sometimes I just wonder. It is really happening. It is so toxic in Washington, D.C. right now. The you know, and, and I, you know, you don't want to generalize. There are some Republicans that are uh, understand the necessity in working together to navigate the American people out of crisis. There are a whole bunch of others that have drinking what I call the Trump Kool-Aid. And they are essentially uh, white supremacists in their ideology. Uh, we had one colleague that wanted to start a white nationalist caucus in the House of Representatives. So, you know, we're dealing with a whole new mentality where they're not there to legislate. They're not there to put proposals on the table for negotiations. They're there to get rid of as many Democrats as possible, to amass as much power as possible, to pursue an agenda of uh, that, that, that promotes violence, that promotes uh, the subordination of other people's humanity, that uh, follow mm -hmm. after the principles of an unprincipled, unethical criminal individual like Donald Trump. And that's what they do day in and day out. You heard Mitch McConnell. He does not want Joe Biden, President Joe Biden to succeed. He has said it. He oh, has no. said it explicitly. No. He said okay. that about President Obama. Crazy. And we Crazy. fought. Mm -hmm. We fought for months just to get health care for the American people and the same people that um, were against Obamacare signed up for the Affordable Care Act, not knowing that it was the same health program. <laughs> exactly. I remember that. And I remember that. Yes. But the thing about it was, is what put it on the map. And I'm so sorry it happened. But in a way, I think it was meant to happen is when they attacked the Capitol and found out that some of the people on the inside was on the inside helping them to come and attack the Capitol. So that just showed the, the world and everybody of what was going on. And you know who, who was behind someone inside the Capitol. So now you oh, know- I, we I, this I've, point, been in the, I've been in the Congress long enough to see the Republican party get hijacked by some extremists. And it started with the Tea Party when Don, when President Barack Obama was first elected, it evolved into something called the Freedom Caucus. Um, once uh, the Democrats lost uh, the majority in the House of Representatives, and then it, and then it just turned into this really radical uh, white supremacist based um, and oriented party. Once Donald Trump got into office. And that's what we're dealing with today is that aftermath. And these folks have not budged. They bow to the altar of Donald Trump. And we know what his policies were all about. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, we're still living with that because these folks are fearful of him. Some of them, others are just, you know, they're lockstep with that mean and cruel mentality that would, again, subordinate the humanity of everyone else in our society outside of their narrow interests. Well, let me tell you, in closing, I was I was shocked when 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 uh, Cheney, um, what did she Congresswoman? No, Liz, what did she Congresswoman? Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Yeah, when she spoke out 
because you know she, she spoke out the truth about how they was acting and everything and you're gonna throw her out of her seat which i didn't understand that because i thought if you were voted in by the people they were the only one you know you you would still serve your term but they might not just vote you in the next time around i didn't think they could just throw you out of your position like that. no 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 she is still a member of congress this is within the republican conference so the republicans have a conference and the democrats have a conference the in the republican conference liz cheney had a leadership role and that was the head of the republican conference like hakeem jeffries is the head of the Democratic Conference, oh, Liz Cheney okay. was the head of the Republican. Okay. Okay. And so okay. uh, what they did was they deposed her because she kept stepping up to tell the truth. She mm -hmm. kept stepping up to say, you know, Donald Trump was responsible for the insurrection and that he lost the election fair and square. She wasn't feeding into the conspiracy theories. And we got to deal with this. You know, these folks, it's like, uh, living in um, a, a world of, of, of the World Wrestling Federation or something is so phony. It's built on so many lies. She refused to go along with that. Exactly. She refused to become a part of the circus. And so they deposed her. It took her out of her position. But, um, you know, she she's still a Republican. She's still a conservative. Oh, she still voted for everything oh, that Donald Trump put forward. But good. she wasn't ready to give up the democracy because at the end of the day, going down that road with Donald Trump, we're talking about authoritarianism, exactly. which is something completely different. This man wants to be the king, okay? <laughs> and they want to anoint him the king. And exactly. our role is to make sure that that never happens exactly. in America, in a democracy that's of the people, by the people, and for the people. Well, make sure you stay safe while yes. you're in Washington. You know, mm -hmm. if, you know, if we need to get you some bodyguards, let me know. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Believe me, I, 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 yes. Shannon, I have a lot of offers. There's a lot of people got my yes. back. So. Of course. Of course. That's what I said. Look, you know, we need to get some bodyguards down there. We will because, you know, we got to make sure you stay safe because. So, Shannon, when, 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 when the insurrection. We didn't have to worry about that in the past. We didn't have to worry about that in the past. It's true. Mm -hmm. And when the insurrection happened, my phone was blowing up. Folks said they was on their way. They was coming down 95. I said, hold on a moment. Hold on. I'm safer right now. I, I'll, send out, I'll send out the warning if they, if need be. Because Brooklynites weren't having it. They were on their way. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. But you just, like I say, stay safe. You know, don't yes. let your guard down and uh, uh, nothing like that. You know, and thank you for continuing to fight for us. Yes, you know, in the Congress, and we really appreciate it, and and I hope you can, you know, stay there in my lifetime. So this way, I don't have to be bothered with anybody else uh, being in that, <laughs> in that position or whatever, you know. And say hello to Ma for me, and then, I will. Uh, I hope she's doing well and everything. So I want to thank you again, you know, for coming on and spending this time with us, and mm -hmm. don't let it be this long again before we but talk again. I All will right. sure that Remington has you on speed dial, Shannon. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. And thank him also for, for, for getting everything together for us. So we want to thank you for joining us for the after show. And um, I don't know about you, but I have really enjoyed, you know, talking to the Congresswoman tonight. And uh, we want her um, continued success and what she's doing because she's a fighter her mother's a fighter and we really appreciate them so we thank you for staying around for our after show and as always we'll see you next time thank you Oh, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't ask you Thank all you, air. Ladies. That was I really nice. Oh, yeah. One minute. I saw you in your car.